everyone. Welcome to Nirmal Bang, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hira Dadia. We have with us Mr. Madan Sapnavis, Chief Economist at Bank of Baroda, joining in. Welcome to the show, Madan. And always a pleasure to speak to you and get insights from you. Uh, Madan, my first question coming to you is, we have the budget tomorrow uh, in terms of 2022. What's the key expectation? Do you think it'll be populist? Or how do you see it in an overall format? No, I think it will be a very practical and prudent budget because if you go by the history of uh, this particular uh, party for, since 2014, I think the walk has been always towards prudence. So I don't think it's going to be a populist uh, budget. It's going to work within the, uh, the freedom which is provided based on the fiscal numbers which are there. In the, when I, what I mean here is that by fixing the fiscal deficit number, you're fixing the GDP growth number, which probably today has been indicated in the economic survey. The government will actually know as to how much of revenue would be earned uh, based on an unchanged, basically an unchanged uh, tax system. Uh, it's going to be driven more on account of buoyancy of consumption or investment. Again, the economic survey talks of both of them being buoyant in 2023. And then uh, given the amount of income which can be raised and the fiscal deficit that can be carried, I think the expenditures are accordingly going to be decided. There would, of course, be a tilt towards uh, capital expenditure, but I'm not expecting anything more than, say, an 8 to 10% increase in CapEx, given these constraints which are there. But there are certain expenditures which will have to be carried on for another year or so. Mm. So, therefore, it may not be possible to completely uh, uh, keep, keep the budget out of what is so-called for the you know, relief for the poor and so on and so forth. That will probably have to carry on for one more year. And uh, therefore, there would be limited scope for going in for a populist budget. Right. So overall, do you think it will retain the thrust on CAPEX related spending to support growth? See, it will talk a lot about CAPEX, but we should remember that uh, central government spending is one part of the overall capital formation in, in the economy. So today, if you're talking of a potential economic size of around, say, 260 lakh crores, that is going by the nominal GDP, which we could expect in the year 22-23, uh, and talking even in terms of a 30% uh, capital formation rate, we are talking of something like closer to 78 lakh crores. Now, out of 78 lakh crores, the government of India today has a capex of five and a half lakh crores. So even if I'm able to increase it to six and a half lakh crores, it's going to be a very small contribution to the overall uh, number which we're looking at. The, the initiative has to come from the private sector, and it's a private sector which is going to drive the investment cycle. The central government can only kickstart the process, which it has been trying to do in the last couple of years, but we haven't seen the private sector or even the state governments pro uh, uh, provide the kind of support which is required to really turn around the investment cycle. Right. And how big a focus will be the national monetization pipeline, uh, say, besides incentives to states to prioritize CapEx? So if you look at national uh, in, uh, infrastructure pipeline, it is actually a, a long-term goal which has been placed mm. by the government. And if you see what kind of contribution is actually put from the budget, it's very much minimal. So this will be going according to the ministry which is concerned, which is normally say railways and roads. These are the two areas in which the central government has allocations. But a large part of this onus falls again on the private sector as well as the public sector units. The PSUs, of course, are doing their bit because there has been a nudge given by the government to spend more on capital. And that's what has uh, emerged in the last couple of years. So I think that will probably carry on. That along with the monetization scheme, which uh, the asset monetization scheme, which the government has spoken of, which will be implemented by the public sector units, there will probably be more resources available to finance the national inf infrastructure pipeline. Hmm. Right, and overall, if you see in terms of where the overall economy goes, how are you expecting the overall tax uh, revenue growth from here on? So the tax revenue will be uh, fairly buoyant in case the government's assumption of 8 to 8.5% 8 growth in real GDP works out. And I think the assumptions that I made are uh, generally practical, I would say. The only problem fact I which I have is with the uh, oil price assumption. We have assumed that oil would remain at $70, $75 per barrel. Currently, it looks as if it's more likely to cross 100 and be in the region of 110 to 120 until such time that there is some order which is brought about. Because oil price is not driven by the normal forces of demand and supply. It is more of a geopolitical issue where politics dominates more than economics. So otherwise, I think with 8, 8.5% growth, we would definitely be able to garner the kind of tax revenue which 
is there in the buoyant tax system. As consumption picks up, I think GFC has been one of the major contributors. The corporate tax collections have been very good this year because corporate profitability has been very good, partially reflected also in the stock market indices. So we could be expecting a fair degree of uh, buoyancy in the market. And the fact there's some comfort that uh, even though in 21, 22, we had the second wave, there was a lockdown for two months. Overall, the tax collections have not really suffered. They have actually gone along the regular path. So therefore, there is some hope that the tax collections would continue to remain buoyant in the next financial year. Right. And can we pencil in gradual fiscal consolidation? And if so, what's the kind of fiscal deficit number are we penciling in? See, but we at Bank of Baroda have projected that for 21 22, we'll have a fiscal deficit number of 7% of GDP. Okay. But I think going by the what the economic survey is talking about in terms of revenue being very buoyant and expenditure being cautious, and I'm not quite sure what they mean by cautious. Are they going to be cut somewhere? It's quite possible that 6.8% number could even be better than we could have a number of around 6.5%. Now, this being the case, I think the government will follow up the policy of moving towards the 4.5% mark by 25-26, which could mean something like a reduction of 0.5% of GDP on an annual basis for the next four years. So if you mean to get something like 6.5% as a revised estimate for 21-22, uh, I won't be surprised if we're looking targeting something like 6% for the next year. Right. And if you have to look at the gross borrowing number as well, do you think that will be similar to what we've seen in FI22? Very much similar, very much similar because we have a large repayment uh, obligation, which is there of 3.8 lakh crores. And uh, again, I'm not quite sure because there's some switching which has been announced by the RPI, but there's some part of that debt of next year because it does cover also next year, could be pushed over to, to future years because of the switch which has taken place, which has happened before the budget. So technically it will be outside the budget and therefore the budget could be looking at a lower level of uh, net market borrowings. We could see some kind of moderation in this number of 12 to 13 lakh crores. But on the whole, I think the market should be prepared for something closer towards 12 lakh crores. Right. And overall, in terms of credit growth as well, a lot of estimates are suggesting that it could be double digit in terms of FI23. And if that is the scenario that we're looking at, how are you expecting the GSEC and the state development loans to act? <laughs> Uh, you know, act so actually, next year is going to be an interesting time because there's going to be a large demand of credit coming from the private sector, the central government, as well as the state governments. And we have a situation where there is surplus liquidity today, and there is quite a bit of pressure on the RBI to unwind the surplus liquidity. So we have a situation where, yes, growth in credit will be around 10 to 12 percent is what uh, I think it will be. And uh, when this demand for credit picks up, and this will gel well with the economic survey, which talks of the investment cycle from the private sector also picking up in the next year, there will definitely be a great demand for funds. And in this kind of a situation where inflation is also moving in the region of around 5%, I think 5, 5.5% would be the inflation rate for the next financial year, there will definitely be pressure on bond yields. So notwithstanding whether the RBI would actually increase the repo rate immediately, or will they wait for the, the year to begin, the new year to begin, and probably do so in the second half of the year, we, we feel that the 10-year GSEC yield could move towards a 7% market. In fact, we tell me by March 2023, we'll definitely be... Right. So is there a possibility we could see upward pressure in terms of where the yield curve goes? Yeah, definitely, there would be upward pressure because I think that's what uh, the, the market is going to decide. And given the fact that uh, we are talking in terms of getting in the Indian bonds into the international indices, I think there will be overwhelming pressure to ensure that the market uh, is allowed a free play and there's not too much of intervention. Because if there's more intervention, I think even uh, external investors will be a bit skeptical about uh, investing in Indian bonds. Right. And other than terms of rural allocation as well, uh, initially, last 80, 12 to 18 months, we were seeing that there was an upward trajectory with regards to allocation to rural India. From here on, do you see that curve flattening or do you think it will continue to remain high? No, I think as of now, uh, with the assumptions which are made in the economic survey, which I'm sure will also go into the budget, there will be moderation. There could be a bit of tapering taking place. We also saw last year that the Nariga program, for example, was scaled down from over a lakh crores to, I think, 63,000 crores. And subsequently, because of the second wave, they had to take an additional allocation of around 23,000 crores. But I think there will definitely be moderation in areas of uh, rural development. But certain schemes like the PM Kisan scheme will be something where you cannot really compromise because it was not really linked to any particular target. And it also came in before the pandemic time. So certain things which are there before the pandemic will have to carry on with similar 
allocations, but in terms of uh, allocations towards anything on agriculture, health, or even the rural development, there could be certain cuts in case it's felt that we will not be having a pandemic-like situation next year. Right. And very lastly, in terms of sectors of growth, uh, which are the sectors which could actually receive a boost? Because clearly, you know, there's a possibility everyone's talking about real estate as a sector. Two MSMEs as well as contact incentive sectors are something that everyone's eyes are on. So any key sectors we should be watching out for? See, in the budget, I don't think there will be anything for any sectors to, to look forward to. And I think whatever support has been given by the budget has been more in terms of relief. It's not meant for growth purposes, it's meant more for survival. So even if I look at the entire emergency line of credit for SMEs, which was extended to other companies, other uh, to the larger corporates as well as other sectors, it was more for ensuring the survival of uh, the sectors rather than for bringing about growth. So therefore, I would tend to believe that uh, in the budget, we cannot really, sectors cannot really be expecting any kind of a stimulus. It will be done outside the budget. Like I think PLI is a very good scheme. There is an allocation which is coming from the budget for PLI. And I think that's something which probably could see some enhanced allocation with more sectors being included. But nothing beyond that is what my feeling is. Absolutely. So key focus areas will be more broad based that we need to watch out for. Thank you, Madan, so much for joining us on the show. As always, a pleasure to get insights from you. Thank you. Stay safe and speak to you soon again. Thanks. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for in-depth interviews of India Inc. and press the bell icon so that you do not miss our updates.